Hi, my name is Michael Gulakis. I'm director of photography for Us and Split, and you're listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey everyone, my name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. So today we're talking with Michael Julakis. He is a director of photography, cinematographer, and worked on a whole bunch of projects that I absolutely love, and I know you guys will too. Um, Here's a few. Us, Jordan Peele's Us. He was the director of photography for that. Uh, He did It Follows. He worked with M. Night Shyamalan on a whole bunch of stuff, including Glass, uh, Split, and the Apple TV Plus series Servant. And we talk about all of these films and what it's like working with these directors and so much more. All right, let's dive in because there's so much to talk about with director of photography, Michael Julakis. So I'm here with Michael Giulakis, cinematographer of basically every movie that you loved in the past couple of years. I'm talking about us, Split, Glass, It Follows, and it goes on and on and on. And we are so happy to have Michael on the Go Creative Show today. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. You have worked with two of the most prolific directors of horror thrillers out there right now, M. Night Shyamalan and Jordan Peele. What a great gig to have. <laughs> this is this has got to be a dream yeah. for a cinematographer. Uh, I'd love to just start with your relationship with, well, you know, we can start with M. Night Shyamalan because I want to talk about Servant, but my God, you have um, really carved yourself a great spot uh, as a cinematographer for two amazing directors. Yeah, you know, I've been very uh, lucky and fortunate and it's been a lot of fun and, uh, and, and, um, and so, yeah, you know, working with uh, working with both of them was was was, was been fantastic. Um, obviously, you know, I've done a few projects with Knight now, um, and about to do uh, his next film once we figure out the coronavirus part of it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, um, um, it's been you know it's it's been it wasn't wasn't horror was never something that I. Uh, was uh i wasn't i just wasn't i wasn't like a huge horror buff or horror person i guess growing up but um um i really kind of enjoy uh of of uh, crafting images in that genre so um it's, that's been a lot of fun what were you into growing up if it if it weren't if it wasn't horror well it's kind of a variety variety of things um i i, I was into music for a while when i was growing up i thought that thought it was going to become a classical musician and and then kind of uh, uh right before i was about to apply to a bunch of conservatories and stuff like that i decided to uh switch i was kind of uh switch to uh filmmaking um because that was kind of another um um passion of mine and uh and so i did that um and uh and, and in the film i guess my filmmaking influences growing up i mean came a lot from my my father was a was a, a big film fan um and uh he kind of introduced me to a lot of you know interesting directors like david lynch and twin peaks and uh and so that i guess on the horror side that was kind of my my horror growing up was that and um but also you know a whole variety of um you know it started with like the same thing as everyone else like you know back to the future and, yeah and uh and and any jones and you know classic you know Spielberg stuff and, and then kind of from there kind of found other directors and you know other films you had Twin Peaks in there and David Lynch and certainly I mean I don't know if people would necessarily say he's horror but he certainly is masterful at making the audience feel unsettled and uncomfortable um and I think you do an excellent job of that with your work with both Jordan Peele and M. Night Shyamalan um and I'm actually interested in that because you know, when you watch, when you watch a film from both of those guys, you know, it's theirs. They have a way of really creating and telling a story that is unique to them, like really from their mind. And as the cinematographer trying to make their ideas come to life, what are the challenges? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there, you know, there's obviously a lot of challenges, um, but, um, 
and each is kind of different. Um, each approach is a little bit different too. You know, uh, having done a few with Knight now, I'm you know pretty familiar with his process, um, which is very um, uh, pre pre visualized in the development stage. You know, in the, in, the, in pre production, he goes to great lengths to storyboard uh, every frame, um, and, and then that kind of serves as a blueprint for uh, how we uh, you know kind of embark into production phase of it. Are you involved? So, are you involved yeah. in the pre visualizations with him, or is he kind of boarding things out and then giving it to you? Um, yeah, no, a little bit both. I mean, we've been, I've been, I've sat with him for uh, a couple films now with him and his longtime storyboard, uh, storyboarder Brick, uh, who's been with him since I think he did Wide Awake before uh, The Stick Sense and has done every film of his with him. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, you know, I kind of listen to, you know, what kind of, there and kind of listen to how we, he's thinking about it and we discuss some things um and and kind of um kind of and now it's you know it's been i think um i've learned his, a lot of how his style and how he likes to approach using the camera and that's kind of in and in, um uh you know infected how i uh um now bring okay try to bring that to other directors that i work with as well yeah my assumption of M. Night Shyamalan is that he's very particular and likes to be in control of every aspect of it based on really nothing. I, it's just the impression that I get because there's such a strong storytelling style and a visual language across all of his films. Like I said, you know, it's one of his yeah. films and he puts his name yeah. on everything. It's never just the name of the film. It's like M. Night Shyamalan presents or, sure. you know, which is kind of Hitchcockian in the way that he does it, which I like. So, When you're working with somebody like that, what do you as a cinematographer have to do to kind of balance making sure that the director's vision comes to life, but that you also get to kind of put your spin on things? Yeah, well, I think he's he's very he is very collaborative, but I think, you know, I think for for me, like the most interesting films that I I love always have a singular voice to them. Um, And and you can really feel, you know, a strong um, uh, kind of a storyteller behind it um you know the that that to me is the most you know um unique films and interesting films when it when it gets too homogenized and kind of too um you know you can feel you know like you, i think you can feel films that have too many you know cooks in the kitchen and don't have someone telling you so so that part of it i really like and try to support and, and uh and so and and so for me it becomes about you know it's it's it doesn't mean that he's not open to hearing ideas. It just means that he's acting as a filter, I think. And he's, you know, he's, he's the filter. So I think any great director, you know, can, comes with a, their own point of view on how they want to present it, but then can listen to their close collaborators, like my, you know, whether it's myself or the production designer or wardrobe or any, anyone really, and, and be able to filter that through their vision of what the script is and what, how they want to tell the, tell the story and then choose, what they like out of those um, ideas and what they don't like. And so, so I think that's kind of the process. I think that, well, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I'm, I'm a big M night fan. I've followed his entire career. I really loved, um, you know, I love servant on Apple TV. Uh, plus I loved, he had another show too, that was on Fox, I think. Um, or FX. Uh, yeah. Or something. Well, um, wait, uh, what was it called? Uh, Pines wandering Pines. Wait. Oh, um, um, something Pines. You're right. Hold on. Now I have yeah. to, yeah, yeah. Oh, Wayward yeah. Pines. That's it. Wayward, Wayward Pines. Pines yes, exactly. Loved it. So I'm a big fan of his. Yeah. But right. I, I, Split was kind of credited as his comeback. Like when Split came out, it was it wasn't just another M Night Shyamalan movie. It became like, oh my god, you got to see this movie. And you know, of course, Glass came after that, and the film you're working with him on now. Um, but I want to focus in on Split because there was something different about Split that sort of brought him back to his roots. And uh, Roots being thriller, horror, interesting characters, uneasy feelings. Um, When you're working with him and you're doing this film, did you know that this was potentially going to be kind of his resurgence? I I always have admired him a lot. You know, Unbreakable was one of my favorite films and it's just completely masterful. And I think, and, um, and so, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, when you're working on a film, you always hope that it's going to be good and hope it's going to be great. I didn't quite know. You never try to you try to be humble about 
during the process while you're making it. And, and I think it's important to kind of be humble while you're making it and not, not expect, uh, too, too, too many amazing things. Um, and so, so I always try to, you know, always questioning things in the back of my mind. So, so I think, but, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I love the script. I was a huge fan of Unbreakable. It was kind of like a, uh, and I, and I, and I loved some stuff. So it was kind of like a no, no brainer. I mean, um, yeah. And, and, and yeah, so, um, so, and then, you know, obviously just having the experience of, of working with him, um, you know, on set and kind of learning how he uh, uses a camera, likes to approach every scene it's, you know, and how thoughtful he is with the camera. Um, so that was all, uh, kind of a wonderful experience, um, for me. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of those things. Yeah. Um, talk about your use of camera movement, how you're using the camera in, um, certainly split, but you can, you can spread it across all of your films with him. It sounds like there's something unique about the way that, you know, he's approaching the use of camera. So talk to me about that. He he tries to approach every scene from a particular point of view Mm. of someone in that scene. Um, but even I think more so than than maybe most um, directors or you know cinematographers, he, he tries to really he wants to feel an emotional rela- relationship from the camera, um, from the frame, um, from the way that camera moves. That uh, is may f- almost feels literal um, to what that character is feeling in the scene or what that what the scene's about essentially. So. If the camera is ascending, it means something. If the camera is de- descending, it means something. If it's uh, you know going from left to right, or or you know if, if uh, any 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 kind of number of things, I think um, he he's trying he tries and debates these things in in pre production and thinks through everything, and then and then uh, you know tries to execute it. And not to say that things don't change. Actors come in, you know, they bring a whole variety of um, you know great uh, ideas, and that kind of morphs morphs into what the boards were, but really there's a, I think the process of boarding and thinking of the camera like that kind of, um, provides, uh, a, a blueprint that, uh, e- and a concept of the scene that even if it changes someone on the day, that concept is kind of been articulated, um, in, in beforehand, at least for him. Let's dig a little deeper into servant. First of all, this was one of the first rounds of, you know, first, Round is not the right word, but one of the first projects for Apple TV Plus. So you were right there at the beginning of the launch of a brand new, you know, network for all intents and purposes. Um, how does that, does that impact the production at all? Uh, does something, you know, were you surprised at all by working on an Apple project? Was there anything different about it? Um, you know, not, not really from my perspective. They were, um, they were really fantastic and they kind of um, put a lot of trust in tonight, I know. and um, and kind of let us, um, and we were very supportive. And, uh, and so it was a, it was a great experience, uh, we had with them and, and well, you know, we were, it was such a small kind of confined show. We were just, you know, we were just hunkered down in our, um, uh, brownstone set that we had built, uh, in outside of Philadelphia. And, and so, um, so, so yeah, so, uh, so we, we, you know, we kind of, um, you know, it was supportive for when, when, when we needed things. How were their budgets and timing? Like, were they, were they reasonable with their, the amount of days they give you per episode? Was the budgets reasonable? Like, you know, it's a brand, yeah, it's I mean, a brand well, we new were, network, we but it's also Apple. Yeah. It's like they need, they wanted to make sure it was done right. Yeah. They're, they're coming into yeah. the game very late. The, st- the streaming game is, yeah. you know what I mean? No, that, again, yeah, I think we felt very supportive. I mean, we didn't have, uh, you know, the budgets like the, um, C kind of style budgets where we're out in obviously Canadian wilderness and, and, uh, hanging off of mountains. We were, um, a little smaller than that. We just built, uh, you know, a four story brownstone inside and the episodes were, they kind of ranged in, um, there was 30 minute episodes roughly. And they're, I think they were kind of around six day, seven day episodes, mm. uh, give or take, um, per episode. And, um, and, uh, and so, yeah, we kind of got into, you know, it was, it was which was, which was a you know, unique experience for me um, to be able to go back to the same set, day in and day out. And it was kind of a wonderful experience because it kind of felt in a lot of ways, I say it kind of felt like going back to film school because essentially most of the 
logistical and practical hurdles that you normally deal with in production just on based the fact that every three days you're moving to another location. Um, you know, also none of the films that I've done have been in the, in, you know, have been huge budgets. Um, uh, so, so we're, you know, always kind of um, coming into a new environment and getting your bearings and then you get your bearings, finally get your bearings and then you leave them back up and then you go to a new place essentially. Yeah. So this kind of, um, uh, was not that it was, it was all in this one place we were, we got to, uh, so all, all that brain power that usually goes to those, um, practical considerations, uh, I could then kind of push towards more the creative storytelling part of the cinematography, which I found, you know, very interesting. Well, the entire show basically takes place in the house. Like it's almost the whole entire show is in this house. And, what I wanted to talk to you about is how do you keep it fresh? Like I was never bored looking at the house. I, I felt claustrophobic. I felt like I was trapped in there, which was kind of the point, but it never felt stale. Like I felt like I was always looking at the house from a different angle. Um, and I'd love to hear your approach. I mean, you're given the situation, you're given the script and you're basically being told, okay, you need to make this house interesting across 10 episodes and you can't go anywhere else. <laughs> it's like, this is it. What are the challenges that you had to face to keep it fresh? And then how did you overcome them? Yeah. I mean, so I think for a lot of that was had to do with this push, which, you know, initially came from Knight. He did the pilot and he kind of set the ground rules for all the directors kind of going forward. Um, and he put this demand in place that, you know, he didn't really want to, he wanted to see, um, didn't really want to see additional coverage, uh, not just, the, not just the, it wasn't just like a, a gimmick of not wanting to see coverage. You wanted to kind of continue that um, process of trying to find a, a motivation behind each kind of move and compositions like that. So, so, um, so, and it gave us a lot of freedom to kind of explore and to, to kind of, uh, to kind of fail too, and, and be able to reshoot certain things. Um, and which was, I think, you know, Really important. So you mentioned how uh, M. Night Shyamalan did not want traditional coverage. Talk to me about that. What is traditional coverage to you, and how did you not do that? What did you give him that wasn't traditional? You know, I think if we would have just gone with traditional coverage for, um, or, you know, essentially, you know, wide and then mediums, uh, standard overs, um, you would have gotten bored of the house, uh, and the characters potentially uh, somewhat quickly, and so I think the um, I think trying to use uh, staging and the camera in conjunction with what the actors are doing to create um, dynamic um, uh, dynamic dynamic you know not just dynamic um, movement dynamic um, angles. Yeah, angles and um, and just um, to create an arc, I guess, to the cinematography um, uh, that's not um, that's not repetitive. I think helped to alleviate some of the, I guess, um, repetitiveness that that w- I think you would have felt by traditional coverage. Um, so so and and that you know that I think very much came from um, that that freedom really came from from night. Um, and so, and if he, and if he, if you'd ever see, we have, you know, the thing we did is we had dailies, um, every day at lunch and the crew would kind of sit and watch what we did the previous day. Oh, wow. Um, cause he's done that in all his films, um, still. And, uh, so he likes to continue that process. So wait, and, uh, you're not getting yeah. a regular lunch break. <laughs> <You're gonna work. laughs> well, you know, you get your food and then you go to the, you had a room set up there and kind of, you know, not, I mean, from the department heads. We we'd, we'd eat and we watched it. What did you watch it? Night would come in. He'd sit with the director. Editor was there, and and we'd um, kind of go through the previous day's work, and uh, we'd all you know and did, kind of discuss it, what worked, what didn't, and things like that. And if you ever saw kind of a shot reverse shot, he'd kind of go, ah, oh, what is this coverage? I mean, mm. so 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 we keep, so uh, so um, so he'd so, yeah, call you out to, if you if yeah. he was seeing just basic shots, he'd call you yeah. out. Yeah, and he tried to push for his kind of a singular. Um, voice within the camera, you know, um, and, and so which was, which was, um, which was great, you know, which is ha- it was it's wonderful to have um, 
that kind of encouragement and that kind of uh, push. Let's talk about lighting yeah. for a servant. Sure. We got a question on an Instagram. Ryan Postis um, wants to know what were the main sources used for such a warm, pleasant lighting for the interiors? And I completely agree. It, that house, for how crazy and psychotic things were in that house, it was <laughs> warm and comfortable and like you wanted to be in there. It gave you, it almost like lured you into this false sense of security, um, of a loving family when all hell's breaking loose behind the scenes. Um, yeah. Great question, Ryan. Talk to us about that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, well, one thing, I think if it was too cold and too austere and, and it would have, um, it would have been off-putting. And I, again, it's kind of in that same vein of, of uh, what keeps you being able to go back to the same space and, and watch it and not get tired of it. So I think it, we, you know, we needed, we, you know, needed to create a place um, that you wanted to see, you wanted to kind of just soak in um, and, and, and enjoy. Um, and, and I thought it kind of like the, the lighting part of it, the, it is this kind of veneer of how they're, how they like, do they want to present themselves to the world and, and without this, um, um, without any, uh, image of, of, of pain or, or grief that they're experiencing. They kind of, I feel like that's kind of the whole thing there in the, and what they do with the food, what the food represents too, is this, um, they dress it up and it's all this pretty thing and you don't really get to see, uh, and, and then you, you've taken something that's, uh, that there's been pain and something has died and there's death in it. And then you've kind of, uh, created this really beautiful dish out of it and, mm. and made it rated. Fancy. So the same kind of style with the lighting kind of approach that too. And, um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very, you know, kind of soft and warm. Um, I, I kind of a big fan of the movie birth that Harris of shot and kind of, uh, just been, um, enamored with that film since it came out. And so there is a, a patina to that, which we tried to apply a little bit to this, um, and so, so, so that was kind of the approach there. And technically, you know, we had inside, um, I, we used some LEDs, um, we kind of used a mix of LEDs from uh, above that were part of the, part of the grid and part of, um, we had, I kind of, my gaffer and I made these, um, LED boxes essentially that would play through the soft ceiling of the muslins up, above us. And I had sectioned them off into quadrants. So they would be all in like two by four quadrants, essentially. So in the, whether it's in the hallway or the living room, you could essentially turn on, you know, any number of quadrants in one particular part of the room just to get a little soft top light or ambience, mm. um, which helped us out, especially for a lot of the, a lot of the coverage that we do is, is, uh, wide lenses, very wide lenses and kind of, um, panning across the whole room and sees the spaces in 360 a lot. So, so sometimes you just need a little bit of ambience and that was a quick way to do it, um, um, and you can control the, you can control the level intensity of it very, very easily. So that, that was part of it. And then, but on the ground, I, I'm very much a fan of, of, uh, tungsten kind of traditional tungsten lights. Um, uh, you know, whether I, I use a lot of batten strips with the bulbs, with the, you know, tungsten bulbs or, um, so that was providing a lot of the light or these, uh, these lights that I think that Mike Bauman uh, Gaffer had made up for Harris of on the bling ring it's called the bling, make all these bling lights. So they're just a, another version of a batten strip, but they're um, smaller bulbs in, in a, a large array kind of a thing, like maybe like a two foot by there's a one, like a one foot, one foot by one foot one. And then like a one foot by three foot one. And it kind of, um, and so those, th those were also another tool. Again, it's kind of old, old school kind of tool. And then, and then, you know, just tungsten bounces here and there. Um, you know, Twinies, Fresnels, and, and things like that. So I try to use a mix of LEDs. Uh, but I don't, I don't go, you know, it's not I try not to do exclusively LEDs. Really, it's it's um, try to use LEDs for what the tool, what, what for for what I feel like is a, what they're made best for. Yeah. Just in general, or specifically for servant, you did a lot of tungsten because it is very warm. It's very, you know, it's yeah mostly in general but also in, in servant yeah it, it's kind of a, a mix you know the leds kind of provided a blanket of where our, our space that we were shooting in the the ceiling the grid height was pretty low you know it was like 22 feet so and we had to light up the, the street facade yeah so the only way to do, only way to do that was really the best way to do it was led kind of blanket lights and and um and um and then you know light gear makes these um wonderful kind of light tarps or light tiles they're called and then uh and then but then we're when inside the house we're kind of pushing in with big 20ks 20k bounces 
a lot. Um, so just four, you know, four or three, between three and 10, three and five, 20 Ks, <laughs> Uh, into muslin frames uh we have you know muslin on curve tracks that kind of went around the set so we 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 could uh turn those on and bounce them into there and just get these kind of soft pushes of light I tried not to get any really hard sunlight coming through because um you know anyone who's kind of familiar with any you know, brownstones in in the city you really don't get too much direct sunlight yeah that's a good point because you really don't yeah. you, you kind of have to light it almost like it's it's basically indirect and bouncing off other buildings. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, and, and I thought that was you know appropriate for the material too. So. Absolutely. On Instagram, uh, Gunjay want uh, wants to know what what led you to discover your style of high contrast soft lighting. So, I guess has it been has it been deemed your style high contrast <laughs> soft lighting? It sounds like it sounds like uh, it has, or at least according to this person on Instagram. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I've never kind of, uh, <laughs> you didn't even know you had a style. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've never, um, put a name, name to, um, yeah. Anything. But I mean, I, I mean, from the, I mean, I feel like a lot of the photographers, the business photographers that I really try to, um, really have been influenced by, um, uh, Savitas or Deacons or, or, you know, Lebesky kind of, I don't know. I feel like there's, um, I, you know, yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I don't know. This was a black site. Uh, uh, I'm always kind of at the beginning of each project. I try to find where, um, what the right black level kind of is for the project, um, that I feel. And so, so, um, so, you know, I did some tests on Servant, a lot of tests on Servant and kind of tried to make a slightly elevated black, but still keeping, um, but still keeping it, um, dark, I guess. Well, actually, the same person wants to know your process of achieving the dark cinematography. Um, can you talk about your exposure choices in camera? Um, did you have an onset lot? Uh, you know, working with a colorist in post. Let's talk about that process. Yeah, you know, I haven't. Um, we didn't. We had a DIT for the first a few episodes just to get us up and running. Um, I created kind of a um, a lot um, in prep that I kind of actually. It's the same lot I used on us. And, and so I kind of carry that over to this and, um, may have tweaked it a little, a little bit. Um, but, um, so, so, you know, we did, we do, we, we, we did tests, we did some film tests, we did some side by side film and digital tests. And ultimately, ultimately, I think because of some practical considerations, why not? We, we chose digital. Um, what, what camera um, do you use? So we use the LF, the, um, Alexa LF. Um, and, uh, yeah, which is my first time using it and i really liked it we did lf with primo 70 lenses from panavision um and um and you know yeah it was like kind of kind of from from the camera test it was uh, with the film we kind of uh uh took that that helped also to give just some reference of what i kind of was trying to achieve with the digital mm. photography so so try to push that in that direction and then um and then yeah we didn't you know we didn't have an onset color we don't have an onset um DIT. DIT. I don't, don't, I don't try to do, I don't really do, um, I don't really do any, um, color adjustments, um, on set. Uh, I kind of like, I kind of like to light for the one lot and then, and then, um, we have a, we have a dailies colorist, uh, and he, and he would, you know, he, he, you know, he, he, he'd, you know, color the dailies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're using the LF. How many cameras did you have on this set? Was it single camera? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we had two, we two camera teams, two cameras, but we re rarely, rarely, um, we're, we're using, we're shooting two cameras. It's, we're kind of use it to leapfrog, um, you know, one camera might be on a crane or on the Ronin, um, and then the, you know, such and such things like that. Um, and, and that's kind of very much how night works. And we kind of continued that, um, one camera kind of philosophy, essentially. Um, we, we had to, because of necessity and, and I think some of the, Dinner table scenes. We may have brought out two cameras for those types of things, um, but, um, but yeah, usually we kept it to one. Is there going to be a season two, of Servant? There is. Yeah. Are you We're, involved um, at all? Yeah, I, I was able to do the first two episodes. Nice. Um, yeah, which which is great with um, uh, Julia uh, Ducorno. I'm sure I'm saying her name wrong, but she was the director from Raw, the movie Raw. Oh, She's, uh, yeah. Fantastic. She did uh, the first two episodes of season two. 
Nice. And um, and then um, and then yeah, um, and and that's all I was able to do from this season. But but oh, I'm sure it's going to be great. I love that show, and uh, <laughs> yeah. your your spirit yeah. will be throughout the yeah. whole season. I'm sure, even though it's only the first two episodes. I want to transition to talking about sure. us. Okay, so yeah. you worked with Jordan Peele on the film Us, which is. I, I absolutely loved it. We had this, the director of photography for Get Out also come on the show, and he talked awesome. a little bit about yeah. working with Jordan, but I want to get your yeah. thoughts on working with Jordan Peele as well. At the beginning of the show, I mentioned that you know he and M. Night Shyamalan, two of the directors you've worked with, some of the most prolific directors in horror and thrillers uh, in our time. Um, and, and I'd like to just kind of first start with your impression of working with him. What's he like? And how did you kind of get along working on the film? Yeah, I mean, he was—he's absolutely fantastic. He was—he's um, such a oh, oh, I think he's a wonderful person, and and uh, but but um, but he, you know, nothing. Um, he's and and has a he's incredibly visual, uh, incredibly visual director. He, he kind of um, we ended up boarding, I guess, for creative reasons, and also just because of some of the practical reasons on us, we ended up actually boarding pretty much the whole movie mm-hmm. as well. Um, uh, a large part of that on the practical side had to do with the fact that, you know, we had four leads that were playing the doppelganger versions of themselves. Yeah. And so scheduling wise was kind of a nightmare. Um, as you can imagine, I'm sure. Um, because we were constantly, you know, cause you can never shoot a scene like you normally would where you, you know, shoot this side and then shoot the other side is the change between the two, um, uh, between the bad and the good, essentially doppelgangers was around two to three hours in makeup and hair. Mm. So, so which made it almost impossible to just shoot a scene, uh, you know, normally, I guess, norm, norm. Um, but so, so which meant that it was, uh, uh, a very difficult scheduling, uh, um, uh, endeavor. So, so that the boards kind of really helped us to, uh, isolate who would be seen in which in which shot, in which in which scene, and then there when we could um, move that around and 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 structure our day uh, accordingly with the with the costume and um, makeup changes and all that stuff. Did you do any virtual previs or was it just storyboards? No, no, no virtual previs. Just just kind of standard storyboards um, for that. But but yeah, but 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 so yeah. I mean, so we got to you know, I, it was my first time working with Jordan, and it was uh, you know he's and so. Uh, so he, and he's he's very visual and he has a um, uh, obviously and, he, and has a uh, I think he has a, 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 a unique style um, to to his uh, to his films um, so so um, so you know it was um, so yeah it was kind of a wonderful wonderful thing. Well, the biggest challenge yeah. uh, of us clearly is the fact that you yeah. like you mentioned four characters yeah. playing doppelgangers. Yeah. Um, he dot smile on Instagram wants to know what were the blocking challenges of shooting the doubles. I know you talked about the scheduling nightmares, yeah. But talk to us about blocking. Like, uh, I, yes, I know you're doing it in the storyboards, but how are you actually shooting it? I don't know how you normally would uh, with, I guess, particularly with the with the doppelganger scenes. Um, so yeah, it starts with the storyboards, and then you get on set, and then um, we block with the actors and things may change here, there, but, um, at least you have the kind of those kind of boards as a, as a, as a basic, but it wasn't, that wasn't too much different. It was the blocking thing. Cause there were certain things that you just couldn't do scheduling wise. You couldn't, you couldn't, um, cause that affected some of the blocking maybe occasionally, but, um, but yeah, that wasn't too much different blocking wise in that terms. I mean, we would I'm trying to think back, we would do, Usually we would do like a good side on one day and then come back and do the bad side on the next day. Mm. Um, that kind of a thing. So, um, and you must have had stand-ins playing, you know, the opposite. We did. For the whole yeah, yeah we had sure. stand-ins, doubles, we did a, a variety of, um, I think doubles and stand-ins and then, um, um, for, for both bad and good. Um, yeah. And then, and then, yeah, blocking wise, I'm trying to think, I mean, it was, um, we'd go through both sides of the blocking with Lupita, I think just so we had a understanding of how the whole scene would play out as both as each characters. Um, but, um, but that was, um, that was fairly, uh, standard. And again, this, you know, the storyboards were a big help for that part. Yeah. 
How did you get the job on us? Um, I th- you know, Jordan was a fan of It Follows, big fan of It Follows. And so I think he kind of reached out to me, um, reached out to me after that. But, but, um, but yeah, and then we, we met and we had, uh, we had some, uh, we met and talked about the project and, and just, um, you know, really enjoyed. Um, and, then, and then he sent me this, the script too. And so, well, a lot so, was riding yeah. on this movie. I mean, Get Out was a massive hit. This was the yeah. next, his next film, I think, right? Um, yes. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot riding on it. Uh, you know, how, how, how do you approach something like that where you know that you're, you know, every film you're on is certainly important, but coming off the heels of Get Out, there has to be some pressure on you to really get it right. And you certainly did. Yeah, well, it was a good, you know, I mean, again, like, I think this, it was again, one of those like get out. I think the script was just a uh, really kind of wonderful, unique, um, interesting idea that hadn't been done before. And, 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 and so I think that having that as a, as a starting point was very helpful. And then and there was a great team of, of people on it. Um, you know, Ruth, who was a production designer, did an amazing job building the, uh, maze and the underground, um, um, and, and so, and so, uh, so, you know, it's a, it's, it's just kind of a, yeah, I guess a normal process of prep and stuff like that. But, um, and George, you know, one thing I about Jordan is he doesn't, um, I've never seen him get flustered about anything. And this was, you know, and especially in his situation, it would be a very difficult situation to be in being that first film being such a huge hit and in this one, but he never, never, ever, um, um, you know, he never got upset or anything yeah. Uh, once. Yeah. Talk to me about the lighting decisions in us and how you created that look. I like the idea of heightened realism in lighting where it doesn't feel it's not, um, you know, such like a raw naturalistic look, but it's not quite, um, you know, uh, it's, it's just a little bit of a, um, a slightly surreal, uh, slightly, uh, look to the lighting, I guess. So, um, well, there's that iconic shot of the, the young girl, and I can't remember her name in that tealish blue environment when she encounters her doppelganger and you get that, that expression on her face. Um, strong color choice, uh, lots of saturation, um, but also maintaining that dark sort of deep black, uh, Talk to me about the decision to kind of create that look because it's now sort of the iconic still of the film. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's. I think it was scripted that the lights go out right in that um, maze in the Hall of Mirrors thing. So it was trying to think about a way that the lights would go out and it would make sense to have an illumination level where you'd still have to get the effect of the mirrors working um, in itself. So because uh, obviously, if it was, uh, you know, just just black then the hall of mirrors effect kind of gets lost so so it was it was so i kind of tried to create this kind of even low level illumination of um of of this kind of cyan um which would then kind of contrast to the underground and the reds and the warmth of the underground kind of kind of thing so um i thought yeah that was kind of kind of nice i guess yeah so, so that's kind of how that, that, that kind of process came out, I guess. Let's talk about the camera package and lens package for sure. Get Out. What were you using and how did you come to that decision? Sure. So we, we ended up shooting, we were shooting Alexa uh, in the open gate format with the Master Primes. Hey, talk um, to me I, about yeah. open gate. What, what does that mean? Sure. sure. So it's just a, um, in the Alexa, it has a, uh, essentially it's just a wider, a larger negative area capture area uh, um on the negative i don't quite know the specs of how that relates to super 35 um i believe it's slightly somewhat larger but um uh, i i I honestly honestly don't know so at the time Um, the the lf was just not available so this was kind of the the step in between yeah the lf wasn't available and the 65 just didn't feel felt uh i wasn't sure if i wanted wanted that i kind of like the smaller profile of the Mini for having that as for some uh, flexibility with the the Ronin um, and um, 
And so, so, so yeah, that kind of, you know, we tested that and kind of, you know, like the look, um, I kind of have shot master primes a bunch up until recently till the, till the servant, uh, with the primo seventies, but I kind of, uh, up until then I, I really enjoy the master primes. I just, for, you know, for me, um, I love anamorphic and, um, um, but I kind of, um, for me, it's it's somewhat of a photo. You know, it's like a, somewhat of a imposing kind of a photographic imprint onto the image that I feel somewhat self conscious about. Um, so, so um, I just kind of like the clean cleanliness and the flatness of the of the master primes. Hmm. So I kind of that's why I kind of gravitate toward towards those kind of. Lenses, yeah. Did you test anything else, or you just knew this is what I'm going to do? I don't think I did. I don't think I did. I kind of, I kind of, just kind of, yeah, like that. And I, we did some tests and I showed it to Jordan and, and he, he, he liked that. And, and, um, and, uh, you know, I did, they kind of develop a lot with a color science friend where we tried to keep, um, where we tried not to pollute the lower end of the curve too much and kind of keep that clean. So the skin tones wouldn't get to, to, um, so we'd get nice and clean skin tones on the lower end. So, so that was part of the, the prep process as well. Yeah, it was super clean and crisp in the blacks. Like it, it was no no grit or anything in there. It was it was uh, it almost had like a music yeah. video look. Like it was. Yeah. And I think that lends to the to the technique you were saying about trying it to be like hyper real. Like everything's a little bit off. Um, yeah. How do you achieve getting that super slick, clean blacks in the lower end? Um, you know, it was just a process in prep with the like with the color scientists and just making sure that there is not, um, too much, uh, too much, you know, blue speaking through or, you know, or green or anything like that, where it would pick up in their skin tones too much, especially I was concerned since we were going to be so much of it was, uh, low level kind of lighting environments and the light, the lights were off in the house for a long period of time. So I wanted to kind of try to do my best to keep, um, skin tones looking, looking, looking good. Do you have a favorite scene from the film? Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of, I kind of always liked when she, you know, the the fight scene down down below with the um when when she she comes down the escalator, and 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 they the two meet together. Oh uh, yes, I mean, I like, Jesus, I like yeah. talk about that scene. I mean, that is that's got to be core. I mean, every fight scene, of course, is choreographed, but in a situation like this, where the two the same person is fighting them, themselves, um, talk yeah. to me about the challenges of yeah. that. Well, you know. You know, this actually kind of goes back to the blocking question too a little bit. Um, you know, we, Jordan made a, I think, a smart and conscious decision that we wouldn't kind of overly do this idea of seeing two of the same person, the same frame. Like we tried to limit it to when we really needed to and when it made sense for the story to sell the effect. Um, but we didn't want to go overboard and, and just to, for the sake of making it a spectacle of, of, of look, look, there's two, two of the same people in the same frame. Sure. Well, so, plus so, by that point yeah. in the movie, you, you're kind of, you get it. Like I get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it exactly, has to be, exactly. it has to be different, but yeah, yeah. keep going. The same thing. You're kind of limited. So in that sense, you know, we, we chose our moments when we wanted to see both of them and there would be, you know, VFX requirements based on that. But, uh, when we weren't doing that, obviously we had to be, we were conscious of the doubles, how much we're seeing of the doubles and, and, and stuff like that. And the same thing we'd go and we shoot. The, the good side of the fight, uh, and then we shoot the bad side of the fight, um, and then you know the doubles would mirror that es essentially. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, uh, it was um, pretty standard, I guess, and nothing, um, nothing, uh, you know, super unique about the way we shot that. I think, yeah. I want to talk about the idea of keeping yeah. the audience engaged in, yeah. you know, a horror film, a thriller, something like that. Um, because I think when you watch a film like us and certainly in split and your work in servant and it follows and all your work in this genre, there's a sense of, um, there's a sense of uh, tension all the time. You always have this feeling of unease when you're watching it. Um, and I think this, you know, carries across all horror films and thrillers, but how did you achieve that in us? Let's say, since we're talking about it, what are some of the things that you do in the lensing or the lighting to constantly have the audience feel like something is not right? 
I think I guess well, I guess it just depends scene by scene. There's not I, I wouldn't say there's a gen- general rule or it's the general thing that I try to follow. Um, I, I think it's um, but but I think that tension can come from uh, I guess a variety of things. It can come from camera movement or it can come from you know just putting the I mean so much of what, what I I'm trying to try try to do is try to figure out where to put you know I think camera placement is is incredibly um interesting to me and i try try to always to figure out what where is the best place to put the camera and what does that say and what does that how will that what does that say to the audience uh, i guess for that moment in 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 the script and um and so i mean it's also something i feel like i'm you know constantly learning about you know times i haven't quite achieved that correctly um um, so, I mean, there's a, there's, um, that's what I kind of love about it. There's no, I don't know if there's ever, a, there's always, you know, like every film is different and every situation is different and there's no, um, real formula to it. I feel like, uh, so, um, so that's, what's really exciting to me in that respect and regarding tension, especially too, is like how, where to, where to put the camera, um, for the scene, um, and, and not relying so much on, um, well, you know, jump scares, I think, are, you know, are kind of, they're kind of boring. So I guess this, one of the scenes that I'm thinking of is the scene in, in Us, where it's the invasion scene, and the bad family is kind of cornering the good family into the living room. And as they're doing so, the camera is kind of moving around um, in an unrelenting kind of a pan um, that ends with on a close-up of Adelaide as she's backed into the living room. So I think that just the motion of the camera in that in that sense, can I think can create a uh, uh, an unease and attention to it, um, and, and so so maybe I don't know. Well, something I noticed is um, the wide angles. You have a lot of wide angles yeah. in that. You've very wide lenses, and you get right up close to people's faces, almost like it, it, I think there's a lot of attention being paid to the talent's eyes, um, and you can really tell you can tell someone's crazy in their eyes. You know, you can like people, crazy people have crazy eyes. You just know it. I don't know what it is, but you, there's something that there's a vibe that you get from people's eyes when someone is insane. And I think you guys are taking advantage of that in your wide angles, right up close to people's faces. Um, that to me was a, a tool that seemed to be employed quite a bit in the film. Um, am I just reading in too much or no, was that, or was there something there? No, I don't think so. I think, yeah, I think, I think Jordan kind of, I think, likes that. I mean, obviously, they didn't get out. It's have similar, I think, frames and similar lensing to that respect. And, and so I think, and I, I always kind of enjoy, like, being being close to feeling the proximity to an actor, I feel, with a wider lens than than being um, uh, farther away. Not not that that doesn't mean that there's a thing in time and place for longer lenses. I think there is. Um, but um, but I, I think you can. Um, uh, there's just a different perception, I think, from the audience. I don't know. That, that I guess I get from feeling that, feel the performance more, maybe. Last couple yeah. of questions um, coming in from people on Instagram. Motion to Reverse wants to talk about it follows. So just just our last few minutes here. He wants to know your approach to lighting in it follows. Could you talk to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, uh, obviously there was several references that we kind of, you know, David had kind of from day one and, um, you know, Gregory Crutzen, uh, the photo- still photographer, Gregory Crutzen. It's a big reference for anyone who doesn't know. He's, he does these, uh, large scale kind of, uh, massive, uh, tableaus of kind of American sub suburbia. What's his name? I'll check it out. Somewhat off. Uh, Gregory, yeah. Gregory Crutzen. He, um, he's, a contemporary photographer. He teaches at Yale. He's close to you, um, and um, and um, and they're just so there's these amazing tableaus, and that uh, Dave, I, I was a big fan of his, and David ended up, David had them in the lookbook, so there was that that kind of that lighting was a, a reference and kind of led our approach to it. Um, oh yeah, I'm looking um, at his stuff yeah. right now. We'll put a link to this in the show notes, guys, so you can check it out. But um, Gregory Crudson, right? C R E W D S O N. So I can see that as I'm looking at his stills as a visual reference for for sure for it follows. 
so that, that, I mean, I think that was, I guess, the biggest reference, I would say. In our last couple of minutes here, let's address Eric's question about wanting to get the visual approach for under the silver lake. Sure. Yeah, that was, um, that was kind of a whole mirage of references. Obviously, there's um, the, you know, The Long Goodbye um, and a bunch of other noir films, a uh, variety of noir films, um, Third Man and uh, Kiss Me Deadly and, uh, and, and, um, and, and just, uh, you know, the locations that we found provided a big um, reference and, you know, LA is a backdrop, but, but so yeah, I tried to I tried to take um, try to we try so we tried to do a little bit here and there. We do somewhat of a throw a little bit of a, a theatrical kind of a nineteen oh, oh, older I guess older style lighting to it. We try to use a little more harder light for some of the scenes, yeah, and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I guess so. That was kind of the general approach, I guess. Well, listen, thank you so much. Your work is really, really excellent. And uh, for people that don't really know that much about you, MikeGDP.com. Smart, making that nice and easy for people. MikeGDP.com. And on Instagram, it's Mike Giulakis. And we'll put those yeah. links in the show notes as well. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much for being on Go Creative Show. Of course. Thank you. All right, I want to thank Michael Julakis for coming on the show and sharing his experience. I learned a lot. I know you learned a lot. That's what we're all about here at Go Creative Show. I also want to thank Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. You can find him at Game Structure and on Twitter at Game Structure. Um, Ignition Visuals, Connor Crosby. That's our producer, and he's the one pulling all the strings and making it all happen behind the scenes. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. And of course, our fantastic, lovely, amazing sponsors, MZ, Education for Creatives. We want to thank those guys because without them, the show wouldn't exist. So please support those that support us. Don't forget, follow us in your favorite podcast app. Click subscribe and you'll never miss an episode. And of course, uh, follow us as well on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube so you can see and hear the show week after week. Thank you guys so much for listening and sharing. And we'll see you next week on another episode of Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.